Hey, welcome guys. I'm Pastor Rex, Senior Pastor at Pursuit Church. I want to thank you for joining us for this week's teachings from our Sunday worship service. If you would like more information, you can find us online at PursuitNazarene.org. My prayer is that God will grow your faith through the hearing of his word. So let's listen in. Here we go. Let's continue on in the book of James. You want to? I think that that'd be good. Um, we are in week eight, talking about what does it look like to have a faith that works for us. And so today, we're talking about making plans that ignore God. And before we get into our text in chapter four of, of James, I want us to go to prayer and ask that the Lord would continue to speak to us through the preaching of his word. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to give. Thank you for the opportunity to worship. And Lord, we want to receive from your word this morning. So God, I pray that through the proclamation of your word, that the gates of hell will shudder and the kingdom will advance here on earth. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for what it's doing in my heart and life. Lord, I pray that you will continue to mold me and mold us through the hearing of your word today. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So here we are in James chapter 4, and we're going to pick up in verse 13 and read just four verses today and talk about what making plans that ignore God looks like. And so this is what James says. He says this to the church scattered around. He says, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, we'll spend a year there, and carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? He says, You're a mist that appears for a while and then vanishes. But instead, you ought to say, If it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. Now James is talking about, he says, let's carry on business and make money. On the surface, that sounds like a great idea and a great plan. That's kind of how our, our, just our economics works, right? People, they carry on business and they make money and uh, we spend money and then we make money and then we save money and we give money. I mean, that's just kind of part of the way that, that it works. And so on the surface, it sounds like a great plan, great idea, nothing wrong. But we have to talk a little bit about the motivation, the behavior the attitude behind this idea of let's make some plans and make some money. Now, I think about making money. I think it's really interesting, the idea of making money as a YouTuber, okay? Having a YouTube channel. I I think it's just, first of all, it's like, I, it's just interesting. I mean, it's, it's genius and it's also like, is that really work? I don't know. You know, because it's like, but it's so cool. You do what you like to do and people like watching you do what you like to do and you get paid to do what you like to do because people like to watch you do what you like to do it's so great it's just awesome and youtube allows for that platform i mean my boys love to watch these fishermen and they go all over the place fishing and so this guy's job is to fish and have a camera follow him catching these fish that's awesome That's genius. I mean, YouTube has just like opened up a whole new industry of I get paid to do what I like to do. Now, fortunately, as a minister of of the gospel, I love to do what I like to do. And there are some Mondays where I'm like, why am I doing what I'm doing? I don't know if I like to do this, but that's everyone's job, right? We all have those Monday morning things. And and yet we're reminded, like, this is really cool. But but YouTube, I'm just, in fact, I went online to like figure out what people are making and all this. They actually have a YouTube income calculator if you get these amount of views and you put this much percentage into your co- your videos you'll make this amount i mean it's just interesting if you 10,000 views and you put 50 percent into this you'll make like seven thousand dollars a year and and that's seven thousand dollars a year off of doing whatever you want to do and having a camera follow you it's just amazing but obviously, back in James' day, there's no YouTubers making money, right? How are they making money? What is it that, that what's the industries that's, that's kind of allowing their, um, their system to work? Well, in the New Testament times, doing business was, was similar to what you see here, but not all of it, similar. Importing and exporting of goods and foods was a big part of, of that time. Um, in fact, the, uh, the food industry was probably the top industry of money-making and 
Uh, local markets were a big part of what's happening, right? If you look at the kind of the, the farmer's market idea we have here, that was kind of probably how they did business back then. And local markets sold grains and they sold spices and vegetables and fruit, goats and sheep for food and for raising. Cattle were sold because cattle were the main like workhorse, okay? They were the ones that really helped drive the plow and all that. Um, farming and ranching was a very common way to make a living and very important in that day. And pottery. Pottery was huge because pottery was used as a common household vessel for water or for kitchen use. And so if you were a potter and making, that was a big part of making money and what the world then needed. Um, Next to food, clothing was probably the the greatest industry. Um, Most women in that day knew how to weave, to spin, and to sew. And um, fabrics, different types of fabrics were used. Cotton and silk, probably the most popular used and most, common, most popular in that day. And men, a lot of men were leather workers or woodworkers, and they would make their money that way. It's just awesome to see how the world worked back then, and we still see some of that stuff today, right? But some men are replaced by machines that men have made, and we've just changed that. But some of the industries have stayed the same. Now, when James is talking about let's go and do business and make some money, he is n- he's not reprimanding making a living. He's not reprimanding or putting down making plans and having a business and being successful even. It's the worldview and the attitude behind making plans, building a business, making money. It's a secular worldview. And that's the one he's challenging because he actually says, guys, if you're boasting in this, it's actually evil. And so he's helping him understand that the secular worldview about business is not the right way for God's people to operate. Why? Because this worldview is arrogant, boastful, and prideful. Very arrogant. This attitude and behavior is like, something sounds like this. I'm in control of my plans because I know what's best. That's the general secular worldview of that business idea. And James is going, hey guys, this should not be prevalent in the church or in God's people. Why? Because... Neither one of us, any one of us here, nobody has absolute control of what's going to happen next, right? We don't. We have no control, absolute control of what happens next. Now, we can influence what's happening next, but we really don't have absolute control. So when we talk about making definite plans for tomorrow, well, you can make some plans and you can influence tomorrow, but really we have no guarantee that tomorrow's even going to show up. I mean, I have some plans for today. After church, second service, my in-laws are in town. They came up yesterday from California. We're going to probably have lunch somewhere. I'm not sure, at home or what. And then we're planning on going to Medford to do some shopping. They want to go to Medford to do some shopping. Okay. And I think that uh, he might take us out to dinner, is what what I hear. I know. I'm excited about that. And so, uh, you know, a free dinner is the best dinner, right? (laughs) You could buy me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It didn't cost me a thing. It's a good dinner, right? I love peanut butter and jelly sandwich, so it wouldn't be a bad thing. And, and then after that, we're going to come home, and we might, hopefully, we can have some of that homemade pecan pie that he, that he made last night, and we, we crushed those pecans at the table. It was really fun, and hopefully, we can have that with a little cup of coffee. Doesn't sound a great way to end that, this great day, being in the house of the Lord, doing a little bit of shopping, and eating together, and then pecan pie. Oh, it's going to be great. What a great plan. What a great day we have planned. But you know what? One text, one phone call can change my entire day. Right? We don't know what's going to happen. Your day can change on a moment like this. Your year can change with a simple text or a phone call. Your life can change. We have no guarantee on what tomorrow looks like. We can plan all we want, but we really don't know what's going to happen. And we would be very, very ignorant to think that we know exactly how it's going to go down and, and it's going to go down that way. And so James challenges and reminds us how small we actually are. What does he say? He says, guys, what is your life? I mean, you guys are a mist, right? That's here for a moment and then it's gone. I mean, and this, by the word, this word mist isn't like smoke that lingers, like a campfire. You know, even after you put it out and put water, you still see the smoke and and you could, you know, go a couple miles away and you still see that smoke, right? Where where the fire is or was or whatever, unless you put it all the way out. It's, It's it. The new vape. You know what vaping is, right? If you've seen someone vape before, it's puff, blow, gone. It's like, boom, like that. Just, where did that go? What is that? You know, what's, what is going on there? It's that kind of mist. 
that's here for a second, gone, and he's reminding us, guys, we're not here very long. This life, we are only here for a moment. So how arrogant can we be and ignorant to think, hey, you know what? This is what we're going to do. This is what I'm going to do because I know what's best. And so I'm going to boast in who I am and what I'm doing. He says, we have to be careful about that kind of attitude. It's just not designed for God's people because life is uncertain. Now, I'm not trying to be harsh or, you know, this is just reality of the way we, of the world we live in. Every one of us. In other words, this, we are limited, aren't we? We're limited. We're limited in our understanding. We've acknowledged that. We're limited in our, and we have, a, we have a shelf life. We have an expiration date. And so we are limited. We have to remind ourselves that we are limited. But then we don't just need to have that as a perspective. We need to add a bigger perspective. We need to think in contrast of who our God is. Our God is not limited, is he? He's not in any way. In fact, I want to explore that a little bit. Let's look at Psalm 147, verse 5. This is the New Living Translation. It says this. How great is our Lord. Now, this is the psalmist. A man writing this about our God. How great is our Lord. He's beginning to understand how great he is, which he is amazing. And then he says, his power is absolute. And what about his understanding? Oh, his understanding is beyond comprehension. In other words, I can't even understand how great his understanding is. It's beyond comprehension. Because our God has no limits. Now, I want us to talk a little bit about a few of the characteristics of God because I think it's important that we understand what kind of worldview should we have? What kind of perspective should we have? If you're a business person at home or even on vacation, whatever you're doing, I think we need to have the right context as we make our plans. And I believe we need to have a good understanding of who our God is in order to have that right perspective. So here's just a few of, of characteristics of God. If you're following in your notes, this is where the fill-in starts. The first one, here, we're going to get a little, uh, we're going to get some big words, some theological words. The first one is this, God is omniscient. If you need to spell it, O-M-N-I-S-C-I-E-N-T. Our God is omniscient. Now, what does that mean? It means this, that he has perfect knowledge of all things. He knows everything. That's what omniscient means. He knows every single thing. Do I know everything? No, I don't. Sometimes I think I know how things should run. Yes. But does that mean I know the best way? No. But sometimes I think I do. But God, He knows everything. And He's always right. And you know what's interesting? Because of that, he never has to learn anything. Isn't that interesting? I never thought, God never has to learn anything. We do. I learn stuff all the time. All the time I'm learning something. And what about this? God never forgets anything. Not only does he never have to learn, but he never forgets. I forget stuff all the time. Yesterday, I went to go help the Halberds move, and I was like, I'm going to bring some donuts. So I left the house early in the morning, stopped by uh, Albertsons to get some donuts, and I went to go check out with a dozen donuts, and I forgot my wallet. And I'm like, oh, man. And so I'm like, can you hold these? I got to go get my wallet. She's like, sure. And I'm like, it's not even in the car. I got to go back home. And so I'm getting ready to leave. And some lady was like, oh, I'll buy those donuts for you. I was like, are you sure? She was so nice. She was like, yeah, sure. It was like six bucks. And so she puts her card in the machine and pays for my donuts. I was like, that's so nice. Thank you so much. Oh, that's great. She goes, I don't want you to have to go all the way home just for that. And I offered her a donut. She didn't want one, which is fine. We forget things, not only information, but just even what we're doing, right? We forget. Oh, by the way, I went home, got my wallet, so I'm driving legally on the, on the road. <laughs> we forget stuff, but our God is omniscient. He doesn't forget anything. He never has to learn anything because he knows everything. Another characteristic of God that we're looking at is he is omnipotent. Now, what does that mean? There's another big one. Omnipotent. That means he's all-powerful. He's omnipotent, all-powerful. And his strengths and powers, they can be exercised effortlessly. All his strength and power, and he just, he can move a mountain by just going, by just nodding at it, just kind of like that, and it would just go. That's how powerful he is. And I, I think about God's displaying his power. There's three amazing ways that God displays his power that we can know of right here, right now. The first is in creation. The creation account, a beautiful account of God displaying his power effortlessly. How did he make this world? By the sound of his voice. Let there be, and there was. The great redwoods, as you drive towards Brookings, he said, let there be, and then boom. I mean, those things are ginormous. 
They're, uh, they're jaw-dropping trees. The mountains, the peaks, you know, miles high. And he said, let there be. The power that God displays in creation is unbelievable. The second way that's an amazing way that God displays his omnipotent power is that is through salvation. Through salvation. Jesus came on this earth, fully God, fully man, aware that his people, his creations were lost in sin, and his plan was to redeem his people, you and me. And so he came and he climbed on that cross and he died a criminal's death, but the blood that was spilt from his hands and his feet and his side and his brow forgives us of our sins. That's how powerful it is. And he forgives us. He forgave generations before us. He forgives us now and he forgives generations afterwards. Everybody in the entire world, his love and his power for forgiveness and salvation is amazing. His power is displayed through salvation. His power is also displayed through his resurrection. On the third day, after his death, his body, his humanly speaking, was completely dead. No breath at all. And on the third day, he rose from the grave. He started breathing again. The blood started pumping again. His brain started to operate and neurons firing again. He actually appeared to people. He rose from the grave. God's omnipotent power is shown and displayed effortlessly through the resurrection. He is all-powerful. God is also, thirdly, eternal. He's eternal. What does this mean? He's everlasting. Having no beginning and no end. Now this one is really hard for us to, to put our minds around. Really hard. But let's look at Psalm 90, verse 2. The psalmist says, Before the mountains were born, or you, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Before anything was born, you were there. Nothing created you. You are creation. You, it's just, and this is, I have a hard time at least with my brain thinking about how he was there before anything. Because why? We have a beginning and end. That's how we think. Right? We're born and we die. In our physical world, everything is a time frame. We just can't fathom what that looks like before and after what? You know, we need a start and a beginning. But our God is eternal. I think about our life. And I'm going to use this pencil as an example. Our life has a, a beginning and an end. And we travel this life, but this pencil in this room, compared to the, the whole of world and the universe, is pretty small, right? We're a mist, remember? And we have a beginning and an end, but our God has no beginning and end. In fact, He can look at our life, and He doesn't just look at it as a time like this, but He can go like this, and He can look at it from the side. He can look underneath. He can look from, the, from, from before and after. And he can look at it from above. And we can only look at it one way. But our God is eternal. He sees everything all the way around. Because it, I just go, I don't know. I don't get that. But that's who he is. Now it's important for us to understand that our God is all-knowing, all-powerful, eternal, everywhere, all at once. Why is this important? Because this is the framework we need. If you're doing business... If you're working, um, if you're planning, if you're a dad, a mom, a grandkid, a, a, we need a framework that reminds us that our God is amazing. And He is bigger than us. And He is stronger than us. And He is forever. Why? Because we need to humble ourselves under His sovereignty to have the correct framework to live our lives. This is what happens. We let God lead when we know how amazing and powerful he is, right? I want God to lead my life with all that. And that's just three of his many characteristics. We need to submit ourselves under God's leadership and then move forward. That's what James is trying to get across. But here's the problem with you and with me is that we gravitate towards pride. We gravitate towards arrogance. We gravitate towards boasting. We just do. And sometimes we don't even realize it. In fact, really arrogant people don't know they're arrogant, do they? <laughs> you go, oh man, here he goes again, you know? But we get into a conversation and we want to we wanna throw in our I know about that comments. Do you know about that? See, you're doing it right now. I'm kidding. <laughs> so you're in a conversation with somebody who's probably well-versed in that area or in that career. Let's just take maybe an ER nurse, for example. And they're talking about the things going on and you, you go, oh yeah, yeah. You know, like, cause, because the capillaries that they're, that where the blood flows at the top and then the bruising and you're like, dude, you're talking to a nurse. Like, just shut up and let them explain it. You know, how, really, how much do you know in comparison to them? 
But we have to drop in, yeah, I know a little bit about that comment. Because we're drawn towards this idea of I know something. We don't want to be the person that doesn't know anything or enough. And so we'll say, oh, I, uh, I just you know a little bit about that. In fact, just a couple days ago, I was in, uh, talking with somebody at the hardware store and we got talking about coffee. Well, I love coffee. Now, I don't know everything about coffee, but I had the idea that I knew more about him than coffee. And I just got excited about it. So I'm talking about how it roasts and which one's the best in town and what you should look for. And he was like, what about this? I'm like, well, tell about this. And there's something about me that got excited that I knew more about him, more, more, than, more about coffee than him. I didn't mean to be prideful, but I just, I didn't mean to be arrogant necessarily, but it was something about me that it was like, I know more about coffee than him, you know, just, and I wasn't like belittling him, but that's what happens, right? We lean towards that arrogance and that boasting and that pride. So we need to have the right framework because of that. Our tendency is to brag. Our tendency is to be arrogant. We need to pursue humility. The answer to that is to pursue humility. And so we're going to keep going in our notes here. But as we talk about humility, this is important. Humility is not thinking lowly of yourself. It's just thinking accurately of yourself. So when we talk about pursuing humility, it's not, oh, you need to, you need to be a less than. You need to be a, just a little puny little whatever. And No. We're just thinking accurately. Like, if I am a puny little, then I'll admit that that's what I am. And so here's how we're going to pursue humility. The first thing, if you're following your notes, is we're going to acknowledge your weaknesses. We have to acknowledge our weaknesses. In fact, the Apostle Paul talks about this in the, uh, the reference of about, the, about the church, and he gives this reference to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 12, it's on the screen, it says this. Even so, he's talking about the church, even so the body is not made up of one part, but many parts, right? Our physical body. Now the foot, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. Or, for that reason, would it stop being part of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, then where would its sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? Paul continues the last that, sen- that sentence there. He says, But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. We have to acknowledge our weakness because here's the problem. is Sometimes when we're afoot, we want to be an elbow, right? Well, the elbow, it gets a little bit more, you know, airtime. I'm stuck in a shoe all the time. What's the, how, how, why is that fun, you know? Or, man, I'd love to be the eyeball. It's just right there, boom. That's what the first thing people look at. Yeah, but how are you going to get to the people, foot, if you don't, you know, walk there? And so we need each other. Here, the bottom line is acknowledging our weaknesses. What is it? What is Paul, Apostle Paul saying is that not everybody can be everything. Not one person can be everything. We all have different parts. And by the way, that means that we have weaknesses and we have strengths. Because I need you and you need me within the church. We're going to need some help. You fill in for my weaknesses. Did you know that? You fill in for my weaknesses. And I fill in for your weaknesses. You have strengths and God gives us his gifts, but we need each other. And when we acknowledge that, we can stay humble. We can pursue humility when we recognize, I need you guys. We are a part of this together. We are a body that operates together. And you know what? In a small church, there's a danger as a, as a pastor of a small church to think that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The reality is I can't do all things. And I can't do all things well. I need the body of Christ. I need us to work together so that we can accomplish God's mission and what he has for us to do. So if I acknowledge my weakness, I see that you are a part of what we're doing together. So that's the first way we can pursue humility. The second way we can pursue humility is this, lift others up. Just lift others up. Paul talks about that. He says, I want you to encourage and build each other up. Encourage and build each other up. The last church that I was at as a youth pastor, the youth pastor before me, had named their youth room the website. It's that right then is when computers and, and online, everybody was going online, so they were like, hey, we're going to be trendy and call this place the website, right? Now, it stood for something, though. It stood for welcome, encourage, and build. He wanted those teens, when they show up to the website, 
the room, the youth room, to be welcomed, to be encouraged, and built up. Really, that's how the church should operate. When we get together, we should encourage, we should web each other, you know? We should welcome, encourage, and build. There's something amazing that happens when we do that. We recognize that we are not the center of the universe when we build others up. We, we, we see something, if I see something in Lorraine, I'm building her up and encouraging her and see, I recognize that I'm not the center of the universe, that Lorraine has a great part to play in all this. It's really important. In fact, you need to turn to the person next to you and say, I'm not the center of the universe. Go ahead and do that. All right. Men, did you make eye contact on that one with your wives? <laughs> I'm not the center of the universe. We're not. I love to see other people reach their potential and reach their goals in life. And you know what? They need you to be a part of that. I'll never forget, I was, uh, I was a guitar, I had guitar students, I was teaching basic guitar when I was a youth pastor. I had some students come in and learning guitar, and there's this one kid named Jeremy, well, he was a student, a teen, and he was talented, and he was catching on every little thing I was teaching him, and pretty soon, guess what happened to young grasshopper? He was better than the rabbi you know he just out outshined me and and just he'd come then and go hey look at this and i'm like what are you doing i didn't teach you that he goes yeah i know i just learned this and i'm like teach me that now the student is teaching the teacher he just surpassed my abilities and you know what it was really cool to see it was really fun to watch him grow staying humble lifting others up is a beautiful thing the third way we can pursue humility is this. Keep exploring. Keep exploring. What do I mean by that is this. Learn something new. Stay fresh. Stay curious on what God wants to do in your life. It reminds us that we don't know it all. Find something new in God's Word. Read a great book. Ask questions. Pursue God and always be a student. What does this do? This keeps us humble recognizing that when we learn something new, you know what? God wants to keep that fresh in us. He, by learning something new and keep exploring, it allows us to be moldable in God's hands because he shows us something new. We get, well, wow, that's cool. And God goes, yeah, because I want to use that in your life right now. And so by staying fresh, by, by keep exploring, it allows the Lord to do something, to do a work in us. Here's the deal. None of us is king. Nobody in here is king. We have one king, capital king, and that's our Lord. And we need to be humble. Because when we humble ourselves, it paves the way for God's leading. And that's what James is talking about in this scripture here. The letter of the Christians here, he's not telling them not to plan. He's not saying that being planning and business planning and making money is bad or even sinful. In fact, planning is a biblical concept. Without a vision, people perish. Planning is good. In fact, if you want to talk about or listen on some good, there's some great things. We actually explored setting godly goals in January in our series called Divine Direction. If you want to go back and listen to that, we need plans. It's important. We need goals and direction. But here's the point. Planning without seeking God's guidance is foolish. If you're following in your notes, it's plan without seeking God's guidance is foolish. That's what James is speaking about in verse 15 when he says this. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. If it's the Lord's will. We preface our statements with, it, it is the Lord's will. Now, this isn't a bumper sticker that we slap on the beginning of every sentence and, and then say, well, if the Lord wills, then we will do business and go about that. It's not just something that you just, you know, just say one little thing and, and you're good. It's the idea of the statement is, if the Lord wills. You know that word Lord is actually the word Yahweh. Do you know what Yahweh means? The creator of the universe who commands everything is the one. If the Yahweh wills, it means, Lord, if this is really what you want for my life, I am seeking you in whatever's next. And whatever door that opens or whatever window is open or whatever we want to call it, as I work forward, Lord, I'm going to ask that you guide my steps. I want, I'm asking that you direct my thoughts and direct me to where you want me to go. I'm considering that you know everything and I want you to go before me. What in your life right now have you just kind of taken off on your own and not even asked the Lord for direction? We do that because we're prone towards another. But we need to ask the Lord, Lord, 
show me. Now, he may go, you know what? That's the direction I have for you, but stay humble under my leadership because I don't want you to miss something. Or he may go, X on that way. You know, you need to turn this way. This is the direction I have for you. And you I'm glad you asked because I have something beautiful in store for you and whatever it might be. We need to seek God's guidance. The question is, or the reality is, what drives your plans matters. What drives your plans matters. Is your faith in your God driving your plans? Or is your faith something that's just once a week? Or just in the morning? Or does it actually impact your day, impact your decisions? The way you run a business, the way who you are as an employee, how you are as a friend and a parent, what you do in your home, how you vacation. I mean, if we ask the Lord, Lord, how do you want me to do my vacation? Then God will remind us, you know what, your vacation isn't just to relax but maybe it's to live into the relationships you have as a dad to your kids. I want you to press into those relationships and spend time with them that otherwise you don't get to have or with your wife or with your husband or with whoever it is. I want you to use this time just, I want, you to, I want it to be precious. So even how we vacation, we can ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want from me? How do you want me and my family or me and my spouse or just myself to invest this time for you? This isn't on the screen, but Colossians 3, 1 through 3 says, Since you have been raised to a new life with Christ, so those who have believed in Christ for salvation, you set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits at the place of honor at God's right hand, and then he says this, Think about the things of heaven. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Why? For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ. This is the last point. Basically this, think up when you're moving forward. Whatever plans, whatever it is, retired, still working, on vacation, think up when you're moving forward. Whatever that looks like. Stay listening and obedient to God's word. Now James ends with this really interesting concept. He says that if someone doesn't do what they know they should do, it's considered sin to them. He, helps, he brings a new concept of idea of sin. We normally think of sin as the bad things that you don't do, which is true. If it's outside of what God has for you and his plan, then yes. But he defines sin in a new way. If you know what you should do and you're not doing it, it's considered to be sin. Now, how do we get to that place? Well, if we are listening to the Lord, if we are asking him to guide us and he guides us in a direction and we don't go that way, we're disobeying God. So as you say, Lord, show me your plans and he shows us, and then you go, eh, I don't think so, I'm going to go over here. Then we've sinned against God because we're being disobedient. So staying humble and recognizing that he knows what, where we need to go and moving in that direction is what James is saying. If Yahweh wills, if the Lord wills, that's what I want to do and that's where I want to go. Nothing wrong with making plans, doing business, and making money, but is the Lord guiding your efforts? I have to stay plugged in to God's word. I have to stay plugged in to being a person of prayer in order for me to hear from the Lord so that I can give direction and, and teach and counsel and encourage and equip the church. You need the same thing. Whatever business, as a student, or whatever it is that you... Subject yourself to the Lord so that if the Lord wills, that's what I want for my life. So the question then is, in what area of your life do you need the Lord to guide? In what area of your life have you just said, well, I'm going to do this my own way, recognizing that that's actually arrogant to not include the Lord in my plans? I want you to guide me. So with that, would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Just a time for some personal reflection. Where is it the Holy Spirit is, is challenging you? Where is it that he's leading you? You might need to be at a place where you say, Lord, would you forgive me for not including you in this? God, I need your direction. I need your leadership. And so, Lord, I'm going to think about you. I'm going to think about what you have for me. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to humble ourselves under your leadership. Lord, may we do what is right as you guide us.
God, your people, this church, we want to be led by your Spirit so that we can make an impact in Grants Pass with our neighbors. I know people, right out, there's people in my mind right now that don't know you as Savior. And Lord, I need to stay humble so that you can help me reach, so that you can save them, Lord. God, I pray that in, in the things that we do, the business we carry about, that Lord, you will guide. Thank you, Lord. Help us to pursue humility. We love you. We thank you for your word today. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace today. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. We hope to see you next week. You are sent. Hey, thanks for joining us today. I hope that you have been encouraged and challenged to pursue a deeper faith in God through what you've heard. If there's any way that we can help you in your new faith in Jesus Christ, please contact us at PursuitNazarene.org and we would love to talk with you. May God bless you this week and hope to see you back again soon. Thanks.